Hi, everyone. Make sure you're in the right webinar, right? This is the 2021 Health Survey webinar. We're going to take a look at findings and recommendations today. So welcome, everyone. First thing we want to do is do some quick introductions. I want to say hello to everyone. My name is Christina Ellis. I'm the Manager of Community Engagement at NHSA. I've been here for about um, four months, and prior to joining NHSA, I worked for a Head Start Early Head Start in Tulsa, Oklahoma called Cap Tulsa for 12 years. And um, part of the roles that I had there was working with nutrition as well as um, health for 10 years of that 12 years. So I was really excited whenever I came to NHSA and they said one of my first initiatives was working on this health survey and health report. So I'm excited to be here today and share these key findings. I also have a couple of other people I wanna introduce. Um, first is Victoria Jones. She's gonna wave and say hello. She's our senior director of data. And so she is the one who has helped us analyze all of this data, put it together, really pull out those key findings um, for us, and has been a big part of writing um, our health report as well. And then Kent Mitchell is also another important part of this team for the health survey. He couldn't be here today, but he's our senior director of state affairs. And he was a real integral part of the recommendations that we're going to be talking about later on today. So let's dive right into starting the foundation of our discussion today, and that's NHSA's vision and mission. And so whenever you look at the vision here, I found it really easy to think about what we did with this health survey and how it fits really nicely into this vision. So whenever it so talks about the untiring voice, I think about that's what we did here is we wanted to hear from you. We wanted to be the voice that got all of these different health managers together to say, this is what's going on in the field. And then the part that I really like about this is it's not only are we unifying this voice, we're also going to have the advocacy piece to it as well. And you're going to see some recommendations today. So it really ties in nicely to leading and to advocating in the vision. And then whenever we look at the mission, um, if you look at that fourth bullet there, so what we are compelled to do, healthier, empowered children and families and stronger, more vibrant communities. Well, talk about tying in nicely to what health managers do in the field. Um, and then also anytime that we have an audience like this, we wanna make sure that we talk about our new campaign, Early Head Start Rising. So our goal here is to address the urgent need to care for and support pregnant women, infants, and toddlers through a major expansion of Early Head Start to 500,000 additional children and families. So this isn't a goal that's going to happen in the next year. Um, think about what it would look like 10 years from now if Early Head Start was able to be raised to be equal to um, Head Start. And there's this nice um, graph on the next slide to be able to show you what we're thinking about here. It's, it's not about lowering Head Start, it's about raising early Head Start. And I don't know about you guys in the field um, who are working um, with health management, um, but I was thinking about all those additional well child checks that are gonna have to happen whenever we have 500,000 more early Head Start um, slots. So someone should do the math out there and put it in the chat because we all know that there's just more health events that happen in that zero to three space. So whenever I saw that um, uh, graph and my health hat was saying, well, child checks and health um, events. Okay, now that we've discussed that, let's go right into the agenda and the meat of what we're gonna talk about today. So we're gonna give you an overview of the health survey. We're gonna talk about um, what it is, some key demographics. We're gonna give you some key takeaways, detailed findings and reactions. There's gonna be an opportunity for you guys to give us feedback through polls and through reactions in the chat that we're gonna talk about later. And then finally, we have draft recommendations. I just love how NHSA, we are solution oriented. It's great that we have um, collected all of this information, but I think it's the icing on the cake that we're also taking that information and saying, this is what we think um, 
we can do to make this better for those in the field. Okay, so a little bit about the health survey. So in 2016, NHSA conducted the first nationwide survey focused on understanding access to and support of health services for children and families. So this report in 2021 is the five-year follow-up to that original study. And we also have some expanded information that we're gonna talk about later that's new to 2021 and also relevant to what's going on right now in the field due to COVID. And so while participation was voluntary, um, the programs that responded generally reflect the national diversity of the programs, options, and sizes. Um, and so let's look at some respondent demographics. And while you're taking a look at this slide, we're also going to launch a demographics poll because we want to know who is in the audience today. And so if you look at the slide we have here, we have a large portion of survey respondents from nonprofits, 31%, and community action agencies at 41%. We also have some tribal school systems in there as well. And then we also have it by service area. You're going to see um, over 50% was from the rural community. I'd like to think that's from my home state of Oklahoma, who um, a large portion of the state is rural. And then we also have suburban and urban, and then some frontier taking up the rest of that pie. And then we looked at program type. And so there we had the majority Head Start, followed by early Head Start. And then you can see the other respondent types as well. And I think we're almost at the end of our poll for our audience demographics. Okay, there we go. So it looks like the majority today are area managers. That's the education director and the health managers, which makes a lot of sense that probably the people who filled out the survey are here today. And then we know we have the direct staff. I, am, I know in the program that I worked in, um, sometimes it was your home visitor, your teacher, your nurse who were completing some of these health events or collecting them. Okay, I think we are ready to keep moving on. Thanks everyone for sharing who we have here today. Okay, let's talk about access to care, our first key takeaway. And so our survey asked about 10 different types of providers and whether families could access providers who one, accept their insurance and are culturally and linguistically prepared to serve them. So we found that pediatricians and prenatal and postpartum care providers were the most available to Head Start families with approximately 70% of the respondents reporting that most or all families could access providers who accepted their insurance. But if you look by contrast here, the least accessible providers were specialists in mental health, behavioral therapy, and dental care with fewer than 40% of, um, of the respondents reporting more or all families have access. And this one here about mental health is going to tie in later whenever we're talking about access to mental health and the services provided. Okay, let's go on here. One thing that was nice about the health survey is that we had a lot of open comment um, options throughout the entire survey, where you were able to tell us more specific information about your program and um, what your needs are. And so we know that accessibility also varies by community type. So we know that um, programs in predominantly area er urban areas reported higher rates of access than those in rural areas. And we have this comment here that's by one of your colleagues. So hopefully some of you will recognize the comments that you made that in general, there's a high demand for medical services and not enough providers. It could take weeks and months to get appointments, um, paperwork filled out, copies of immunizations, things like that. And then you also mentioned that if you were to get it, um, making sure that it was complete was also a concern. But let's talk now about the number one thing that came up over and over in um, this survey, and that was transportation. 
transportation is an issue. So we had um, one respondent say that if you live in the same town as the doctor, Medicaid transport isn't available. So there's, and if you're in a place where there's little public transportation, um, and there might also be places where it's unsafe um, for them to walk to it as well. So Head Start programs consistently work to make medical appointments more accessible for families, often um, through translation and transportation services. So for many programs, the cost of these services comes right out of your budget. So despite the fact that families, most of them are eligible to access these services through Medicaid, um, due to transportation issues, um, or maybe translation issues, you're still having to perform these on site. So 43% of programs report already providing transportation for families out of their budget um, if they don't have the necessary transportation themselves. And more programs are helping families ask, access transportation through Medicaid compared to five years ago. Um, so, so that's great to hear that compared to whenever we did this in 2016, where only 34% said that families were accessing transportation through Medicaid, that's been up by 42%. But it's still a significant portion of programs providing these service using the program funds. So that's our first reflection that we're going to talk about is access to care. And so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna launch a poll, but we also encourage you to answer these two questions in the chat box. So what insights or new questions come to mind when you're looking at this data specific to access to care? What does your program do in this area to support children and families that could help others or us understand better? And we'll give you some time to complete that poll. And what we're finding here based off of the poll is that, yes, this is what you're finding in your areas as well. And then I see lots of chats coming through and I know Victoria and Lucy are monitoring that as well. People in rural areas are saying that transportation is a barrier there as well. So we'll let you just take a couple more minutes to keep filling in the chat and responding to these two questions. And also this is a good time to um, also call out that there are additional findings that we have and um, more data um, available, but these were sort of the key takeaways and things that we were seeing over and over again in the data that we were finding. Okay, so now we're gonna move to screenings. And so we know that healthcare is a critical component of the Head Start model, but these screenings do require a significant amount of staff time and at times can be burdensome on program budgets. And if you look here, we have the question was, how do children usually have the following types of screenings? And then we listed six screenings. And the options were, you provided the screenings, maybe it was a hybrid, but in our findings, four of the six um, screenings mentioned in the survey, and that would be vision, hearing, behavioral, and developmental, are most often done by programs themselves, meaning the cost of materials and staff time comes out of the program budget. So approximately 70% of programs report providing these screenings themselves with another 15 to 25% reporting that they do some screenings while um, pediatricians do others. I always um, like to remind people whenever um, I'm talking about Head Start performance standards to those who are new to the program that it says perform or obtain. So if you have a good relationship with a provider and they have evidence-based screening, you're also able to obtain it and not have to perform it. And then 60% um, of programs report paying for these screenings out of their own budget. And this is a slight increase from our 2016 survey. And this appears to be driven by there being fewer community partners providing these screenings at no cost to the programs, such as a community health fair where maybe you brought in multiple providers at no cost to do the screenings. And then of course, during COVID, not being able to be on site also resulted in um, lower access to community health fairs. 
Um, I'd also say additional guidance from the Office of Head Start on um, the use of funds for medical purposes could also um, be a driver um, in doing more of these screenings in-house. So our next slide, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into screenings here. And so while we know a significant benefit to having healthcare provide, um, um, providers conduct these screenings so that they can bill Medicaid or insurance for the cost, it adds a layer of complication when it comes to getting results back to the program. I like to say that sort of performing it and getting the results back are sort of half of the battle. Then there's sort of the response and the follow-up to the screenings. So approximately 30% of programs report that even when health providers perform these hearing and vision screenings, they still have to do additional screenings because the results shared with them, they might be a pass-fail type of result, or they're lacking those important details that you know you need to have um, to count it, um, not only in compliance, but more importantly, to be able to provide that additional support and follow up with that family. And then another 40% of programs report that only some of the results they get are useful, while others required additional screenings by the program. So if you received a screening and it didn't share, for example, what type of screening it was, it would be hard to know if it was evidence-based and therefore a program um, might have to do that screening um, again. Or when children fill a hearing or vision report and no additional information is provided, the burden often falls on the program to investigate further. So now that we've talked about screenings, let's do our second reflection. And again, we're gonna launch a poll, but in the chat, let's talk about insights or new questions that came to you while looking at the screening data. And then what does your program do in this area to support children and families that could help others or help us understand better? So again, this one is specific to screenings. And quick look at the polls. It looks like um, similar to access to care. This is um, also what you're seeing in your program. And I'll interrupt real quick, Christina, to say, especially if you're someone saying, no, this isn't really reflecting the patterns that you're seeing in your program, we would especially love to know in the chat what you're seeing that's different. Um, we're help is helping us collect more information to make sure that our recommendations and our findings are correct. Thank you for sharing that. And that also reminded me, Victoria, whenever I was um, going through um, some of the comments, um, there were a couple who have been successful in working with partners and getting screens or access to care. And so um, these, especially if it's something that could be replicated, we want to be able to share that out with the field. All right, seeing some good chat there. Okay, I think we're ready to go ahead and move on to dental care. So I've been talking a lot about the open-ended questions because I love the data, but then whenever I read the open-ended questions, it provides me so much more context to what the data is saying. And whenever we ask, what are the three most important health issues in your community? The most common one-sided, was dental care. And I thought this quote here was perfect for it, that dental providers that do exist do not accept Medicaid due to low reimbursement rate and a higher rate of no-shows as well. And so you guys noted several specific comments in particular. So one of those is dentists not serving children under the age of two. And it just blows my mind that that's still a thing in the world, um, that they're still not serving those under the age of two. And they're not accepting Medicaid or they've met their maximum on Medicaid patients. And then also parents um, either also not being aware that they can go in before the age of two or keeping those treatment appointments for dental and specific, um, specifically. So we do have some data here to share with you related to dental care. And we'll go ahead and share that. So to understand the extent of the need, um, we asked which best describes the number of providers in your service area who accept your family's insurance to provide preventative or follow-up care to children. And this one was specific for dentists. 
And so less than 40% of respondents said that most or all families they serve are able to accept um, access dentists to accept their insurance. So these numbers are nearly identical when asking also about the linguistic and cultural preparedness of dentists. So the rate of accessibility we see above is a slight decrease from five years ago. So then 46 respondents said that most or all families could access um, dentists that accept families insurance. So this downward trend um, is also seen in partnerships as well. So um, this year, 78% of programs reported partnering with individual dentists, and that's down from 85% in our previous survey five years ago. And if you've got any information on why you think that's happening, please also put that in the chat um, because I'd love to hear from the field why they think that um, we're trending downward in partnering with individual dentists. Okay, so we're gonna take a big pivot here from dental care and we're gonna go to mental health here. And so I mentioned with dental care that one of the most often discussed thing was dental and oral care. And very close to that is going to be mental health. It's going to be no surprise to you that throughout the past several years, mental health has become a common topic of the national conversation around health. And we see this in everything. Um, we see it from the increasing opiate epidemic um, to the uh, most recent effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Mental health has been and remains a significant concern of the programs in terms of supporting the health and wellness of the children and families we serve. So mental health and behavioral problems were the second most important health issues underneath dental care facing um, communities. So this is even separate from specific things like substance use and abuse, which ranked as the sixth highest issue. And as the quote here says, families in our community are in dire need of mental health support and services. And so let's go ahead and look into mental health and the numbers that we have here. So in order to address the mental health and behavioral needs of Head Start children and families, most of the programs have been adopting the principle of trauma-informed care in their services. So you look here at our first um, bar, and that's 87% of respondents report implementing trauma-informed care for children, and 78% do for their families as well. And then sort of a different look at this is programs who provide screening for depression for all parents. And so this first bar graph here in red is currently provided to all families. And then if you go over to the green at 30%, this is provided to families with a demonstrated interest or need. So if a family comes to you or in discussions with them and they have a need, um, that's whenever the depression screening would happen. And then 61% of you said you would want to provide it if the program had additional resources as well. And then let's look at behavioral screenings, which I mentioned, um, it was mental health and then behavioral. So a positive change that we've seen in the two surveys from 2016 to 2021 is regarding the mental health is an increase in pediatricians conducting behavioral screenings on children. Um, and so in 2016, only 4% of programs said pediatricians were doing the screening compared to 13% today. So that's a real positive change. And also at the level at which programs are partnering with mental health behavioral therapy um, practices. And so here we have 45% um, of programs reporting partnering with therapy practices. So definitely a bright spot. Um, not meeting the needs of where I'm sure we would want to be, but a step in the right direction. So in this last section, we talked about dental care, mental health, and behavioral screenings. So we have our poll up here again on what insights or new questions came to you while looking at this data, and what does your program do in these areas to support children? This reflection here, I think, has a lot more yeses. I think a lot of people are in the same boat um, with mental health and dental care. 
And please also make sure to continue to put reflections in the chat as well. Okay, like I mentioned earlier, um, we wanted to keep the information that we had from 2016 intact as much as possible so we could see those trends. Um, but we also knew that we needed to stay current with what's happening now and what's important in the field, um, sort of maybe outside of those um, compliance requirements with Head Start performance standards as well. And so these are some key takeaways here. And one is on social determinants of health. So in order to understand the broader context of health among Head Start families, we ask programs about um, various social determinants of health that their families might face. And like it says here, unsurprisingly, we found that the majority of families are facing these environmental conditions that negatively impact their health and well-being. So we had 27 respondents report that homelessness and um, unsafe housing was one of the top three most important health issues in their community. We had um, 17 highlight nutrition and nine cited racial inequality. And while it didn't come up consistently, we also saw neighborhood um, violence, domestic violence, child abuse brought up several times as top health issues facing a community. And so we thought that that was important to share it. And we're also looking forward to ongoing surveys that we can really pull out more information there related to social determinants of health. Another thing we wanted to do is take a closer look at COVID-19 and nutrition and housing. And so what we did here is we asked the question how programs ensure children and families received adequate nutrition during COVID-19. And um, I thought about what we did in my program in Tulsa, Oklahoma, whenever COVID happened, and how at the very top of the list was food, because we know we were responsible for the breakfast, lunch, and snack for children in our care. And so um, we asked all of you, and I'm sure most of you did um, a variety of these things. There probably wasn't just one specific thing that you did, um, but um, we had a large portion say that they provided food for pickup at a designated location or food was sent home with children. And we also saw that um, maybe food was sent home with children, but also for the families and other children um, in their home. And then there were partnerships with local community outreach programs, partnerships with local food banks. There was deliveries of food to homes. I saw lots of pictures and heard lots of stories of seeing the um, Head Start van or the public school bus in a community or an apartment complex delivering food um, to families. And um, a lot of the way that you served food during COVID-19 had to be changed. It had to be packaged differently, right? Um, and so those USDA waivers were really important to ensure that we could get the nutritious food there, but also understanding the delivery of it or the packaging of it had to be a little bit different. Um, and then the other thing that we wanted to learn a little bit more about was um, how programs supported families. Um, experiencing homeless or unstable housing during COVID-19. And so the majority of you had partnerships with local community outreach programs, partnerships with local homeless shelters, um, faith-based organizations. And then some of you also provided direct financial support to these families experiencing homelessness or unstable housing. And so again, we wanted our survey to really be relevant to what was happening right now. And we knew that COVID was an important part of that. So I'm glad that we were able to put this information in there and be able to look back at this and also know that what could we have learned um, from this experience, whether it is serving children food or helping those families experiencing homelessness um, to continue on um, uh, in future years. And so hopefully you have built partnerships that are going to be evergreen um, with these programs and not just um, here during COVID-19 and then the partnership stops. So we really hope you're able to continue those partnerships. And now for our final um, reflection on the key takeaways. 
is again, this is about the social determinants of health and the closer look at nutrition and housing as it related to COVID-19. So we do have a poll. And then also we would encourage you to put your reflections in the chat as well. And that is what insights or new questions came to you while looking at this data and what programs um, or what does your program do in these areas to support children and families? Was there something that um, we missed or information you would like to know more about as it relates to um, these two topic areas? And we'll just give you a few more minutes to go ahead and do that. Resiliency, that's a great one, Aisha. I see the message there about undocumented families and there were a lot of comments in the opened ended comment section um, about that as well. Okay, I think we're ready to move on to our next section. And so what I mentioned earlier is that we've collected all of this information, we've analyzed it, um, but we also wanna know what we can now do. So we have all of this, what do we do with it? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna make recommendations. We have some that are gonna be specific for the Office of Head Start. And then we have some that are sort of bucketed in our other recommendations that I'm gonna share in the next slide. But for this one, I wanna talk about um, what we have here. So the first recommendation based off of what we've gathered is expand health training and technical assistance to early childhood programs. And that's specific to health. So early childhood focused training and technical assistance centers. So whenever you think about that, think about centers such as the National Center on Health, Behavioral Health and Safety that's funded by the Office of Head Start. So we think they should specifically address key areas of concern brought up in the survey. So including how the program can draw on Medicaid to expand transportation options, because there were a lot of call outs on, um, we have Medicaid transportation, but it just doesn't meet the need of our families. If they've got multiple children that have to go with them or the hours don't work out, or I have to book so far in advance um, as well. The other thing that they can do is identify bilingual support organizations, um, including, um, sorry, identify bilingual support organizations and educate parents and qualified providers about the full range of checks required in a well child visit. You mentioned that several times in your survey. And um, I also, as a manager of health for 10 years understand when you get that well child check back and it's missing the lead or it's missing another important piece that we need parents and providers to understand the requirements. Um, and then also offer information on other Head Start program practices around health and model community partnerships. So highlighting those programs that are doing it really well. So that's our first one is expanded training and technical assistance. The other one is to expand parent education to address key gaps um, in underservice for young children. So many gaps in children's health services are due to an inadequate parent education about the importance of such care and how to access it. Community partners can play an expanded role in offering parent education and engagement on these topics. So the Office of Head Start should continue to play a leadership role here, expanding availability of the culturally and linguistically appropriate resources around oral health, because um, as you recall, that's the number one concern that our respondents had and other key um, areas of underservice um, identified in the survey. And so we know we need to expand parent education here. And then um, the third one for recommendations for the Office of Head Start is a more holistic monitoring and compliance from the Office of Head Start, and I better see lots of thumbs up on this one, um, is accommodating family pre um, preferences can promote consistent health habits. 
So hard deadlines around health screenings and other requirements can come at the expense of that relational work of partnering with families. So if I'm working with a family and I'm trying to get a well child check, but they're also experiencing homelessness, um, there it might take a little bit longer to get them access to care. Not that it's not as important, but meeting families where they are. And so partnering with the families around their child's health. Um, so this relational work, it's important, just as important as meeting the deadlines for screenings. So the ultimate goal of monitoring and Head Start should be shifted over time to focus on a combination of the actions undertaken as well as the deadlines met. And also relational metrics, efforts to address the social determinants of health, and ultimately a child's health progress. And then um, our final one for the Office of Head Start, um, thank you for that thumbs up over there, um, is Elevate Phil Training on um, Racism as a Public Health Crisis. And so for this one, as noted in the survey, 45% of respondents said that many families experience race-related health inequities. So the CDC recently said that racism is a serious public threat that directly affects the well-being of millions of Americans. The CDC went on to say, over generations, these structural inequities have resulted in stark racial and ethnic health disparities that are severe, far-reaching, and unacceptable. So the Office of Head Start should partner with the CDC's racism and health campaign to learn more about this finding and to offer relevant training. So those are the four recommendations for the Office of Head Start, but there's also some recommendations that um, sort of fell in a miscellaneous, things that we knew um, needed to happen, but not necessarily related to the Office of Head Start. And I think we're ready for the other recommendation slide. Okay, so the first one we have here is to expand federal and state funding for mental health supports for young children. Several of you um, stated that if you had more resources, you would be able to do more, like screening parents for depression. So more federal and state funding is necessary to expand supportive mental health prevention and intervention services to young children and families, including infant and early childhood mental health consultation. Historically, due to limited funding and less empirical focus on young children, public funding has been skewed towards adults with identified mental health diagnosis. Congress, state legislators, and relevant federal, state, and local agencies should invest in building systems of care for young children with a very broad range of prevention and intervention services. Whew, that's a lot for expanding federal and state funding, but that's an important one. And then health records um, partnerships with families. So state Medicaid agencies and leading state early childhood agencies should develop policies and protocols that allow trusted community agencies like Head Start to work in close partnership with Medicaid enrolled families to gain the appropriate access to medical records. And so if you're the person responsible for gathering medical records and all of these events, you know that it can be difficult and time consuming, whether accessing it from the parent or from the medical provider. Um, but if your state or your community has a centralized health record system and then giving access to programs like Head Start. So some of you in your communities, you might have access to things like shot records and um, lead testing if your state has a centralized lead testing bank of data. And so um, we know this would require bi-directional sharing between programs and qualified healthcare providers to coordinate the care. Um, but we think that this would be something um, that leading health organizations to move Medicaid prevention services upstream to programs that serve young children. And this is gonna reduce duplication, um, promote cost effectiveness and optimize child health outcomes. And then telehealth partnerships. Talk about COVID just pushing us into this direction. And so earlier we talked about transportation and we also talked about translation services 
being in need. And I'm not saying telehealth um, solves all of this completely. And there are some concerns that people have with telehealth, um, but it's only likely to expand due to COVID-19. So telehealth does remove key barriers um, like wait times as well. And it's critical for expanding access to key specialists. And so earlier, whenever I talked about access to care, I said that, you know, access to medical providers um, were high, but whenever you start getting into the more specialized um, providers like mental health or follow-up um, therapy agencies, you're going to see a lot less access, especially in your rural communities. And so um, federal agencies, including the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and states should prioritize telehealth services to young children enrolled in Head Start, um, offer clarifying guidance and technical assistance, and also study the impact on enrolled children and families. And so a lot of these things, like I said, are coming out due to COVID, but there should also be some study on what that is looking like and how it's impacting families to move to telehealth. And then the final recommendation is expand postpartum care. So the 2021 American Rescue Plan offers states the option to expand postpartum care within Medicaid from 60 days to one year. This expanded option um, recognizes that the health needs and risks to new mothers extend well beyond those 60 days and the imperative, um, and it's imperative to address these racial disparities and postpartum health outcomes. So every state should take up this option and partner with early Head Start programs to coordinate services and support to enrolled families through this critical period for maternal and child health. So what do you think about these recommendations? So we have here another poll. So what additional recommendations are we missing? I know we talked a lot about the different findings today and the key takeaways. But what we're missing, for those of you who said this isn't what you're finding in your community, or you mentioned other things in the comments, what additional recommendations would you um, suggest? And what change would you like to see to the existing draft recommendations? So if you can go ahead and complete the poll, I don't see anything in the poll yet. So I don't know, Victoria, if um, it's still going and it's okay if I don't see the responses there. Yes, it is on and open, but there's it's a little bit long because we're asking you to respond to each recommendation to help us understand how accurate uh, they are. That's what it is. It's going to take you a minute to answer them all, but we appreciate your time on it. Thank you. So yeah, take a minute. I see a lot of agree, strongly agree for the recommendations. And again, if there's any disagreement as well, we'd love to hear the reason why. Um, so you can put it in the chat. And then also at the end of the presentation um, is my email address. And at the beginning of the presentation was Victoria's, so um, mine and Kent's. And so if you would prefer to chat with us separately, you can do so as well. So just give everyone a little more time to look at the reflections. There are a few things in here with um, disagree. We've got a lot of agree, but some disagree. And so in particular, if you disagree or you think it's not quite right or it should be the other way, absolutely let us know in the chat box. And you can send a private message to me or Christina if that makes you feel better. Um, but it'd be really helpful for us to understand. I know, Brenda, it is hard to choose just three as the most important. Okay, how much more time, Victoria, do we have on this reflection? I think we're probably good. I'm going to give a countdown from 10. If you haven't finished yet, finish fast. I'm going to... Close it down in three, two, one.
Okay, so what do we do next? So we've gathered all of this information. You took the time to fill out the lengthy survey, or you've taken the time to come to the presentation to learn more about what the respondents have said. And so we're taking the data, analyzed it, had those key take, um, takeaways. We're gonna review the feedback that you gave today during the webinar. And we're also going to fine tune those final recommendations as well. So the feedback that you're giving today and participating in the different chats and reflections, that's gonna help us um, really um, fine tune our report and make our final recommendations. And then a full report will be launched in November, 2021. So today you got a sneak peek at it, but we will have a nice slick report as well um, that you'll be able to utilize in a variety of different ways, sharing it with others in your organization. Um, whenever we are working on the recommendations that we talked about earlier, we'll be able to take um, the information in that report and share it with these key partners that we have. And so that will also um, come out um, whenever we launch that full report. And so, but what are next steps for this webinar? So this is also another poll. And <laughs> we, I know you guys are like, whenever you said we're going to be engaged, we meant it. Okay, guys. And so what we have is a poll here. And what policy or practice would you like to explore or implement in your program? And so in our poll is just, is there one, a yes or no? And then what topic um, does this new practice or policy relate to from our key takeaways? I see mental health is in the lead here, which is no surprise based off of the key takeaways and the findings that mental health um, is still a subject that needs more discussion. I also want to remind everyone that the recommendations in this PowerPoint are draft at this point, and then the final recommendations will be available in the um, report that the full report that is launched. Okay, I think things are starting to slow down here. Okay, let's go ahead and go to our final slide and close it out. Um, first of all, I wanna say thank you to all the survey respondents and today's attendants. I think about the time that you all have, whether you're health managers, um, staff in the classroom, directors, anyone who right now is working in a program in a staffing crisis that takes the time to come to a webinar and hear about what um, others in the field um, have said is a huge accomplishment. So I really appreciate you taking the time um, today to be able to do that and to really engage each other in the chat and the polls. Like I said, we really wanted this to be active and for you to know that we're not done with our report yet and that we still wanted to continue to gather feedback from you that this is what we came out of the survey. This is our key take, um, takeaways, but is it still resonating with the field? So to be able to see so many of you say, yes, this is what you're seeing, I think really validates um, the key takeaways that we're finding. Um, but I also think it's important for those who um, weren't finding the connections here in this survey to provide us some additional um, feedback on that, um, because there might be some way in the future that we can even tweak our our questions to be more relevant to what you're seeing. And um, the other thing is that um, this doesn't have to be the end of the conversation. So if you'd like to speak with any NHSA staff about the information shared today, um, you can reach me directly and my email information is there. And then um, Victoria, I'm sure because you won't mind because your email was on that first slide, is if you've got data specific questions, you're gonna wanna directly reach out to Victoria because more than likely I would um, bounce you over to her as well. Um, and then if you've got info, any questions about um, recommendations or the survey 
or how to connect with other um, health managers, other health staff in the field, definitely send that um, my way and I can help you make that connection. So again, I want to thank everyone for your time today. Um, Victoria, any closing remarks or any making sure I'm crossing all my T's here for getting any information that you need? I think you're good. I just, I uh, thank you to everyone for joining us today. I thank you for those of you who took the survey. Um, you know, double thank you on that front. We are always hoping to hear from you guys when we send those out and try not to bombard you too much. So yeah. we very much appreciate it. All right. Well, enjoy six minutes back of your day. Um, if you're on the East Coast, it's probably the end of your day. Sorry, West Coast guys. Um, maybe take a little break before your next meeting and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you.